Myrtle Grove is a grand Elizabethan house at Yole on the southern coast of Ireland. It looks a bit run down, but it's slowly being restored by the owner as a memorial to its previous occupants, who've included an order of monks and a British governor in Hong Kong. Myrtle Grove's real claim to fame, however, is that around 400 years ago, this was the home of Sir Walter Raleigh, the famous explorer who sailed to the New World and brought back two products which revolutionized Elizabethan society. The potato, he planted the first ones here in this front garden, and tobacco. <coughs> Thanks, Walt. You must wonder why on earth I've brought you here. But first of all, this is one of the earliest unfortified houses in Ireland. It's a 16th century house. You can see the gables there. And the important thing is it's never been restored. True, they've altered these windows. They put in big sash windows when they wanted them. But it's got this wonderful, mellow feeling that Evelyn Waugh had this phrase, houses where time had stilled the hand of the dull workman. If you look at this stonework, you can see this really quite heavy pointing, but it's mellowed into the house, it's the same colour as the stone, and over it are these wonderful lichens, these little plants, which I think are one of the great friends of architecture, because they grow over cement. You can see even where the windows are cement, that these lichens have grown over it and softened it. And it has this wonderful mellow colour the whole way across the facade. If Raleigh was to walk down the drive today, would he still recognize the place? I think so. It's still the same gabled entrance front, has the central entrance porch. There was an oriel here in which he sat and smoked. It might have been the one above this porch. And over there are the yew trees under which he sat. I'm sure in his time they would have been neatly clipped, you know, hardly more than 10 feet high. Well, now, of course, they've grown wild. And they're magnificent specimens, 30, 40 feet high and certainly old enough to have been here when Raleigh owned this place. Walter Raleigh was an important figure in Yule, wasn't he? He was the mayor of the town. He was sailing backwards and forwards across the Atlantic. He was on his way to Devon, and to London, and he wanted a base here. And I think this house reminded him of his own stone house in Devon. He felt very much at home here in Yule. The special appeal of this house is that it's still lived in, completely a family house. That it's not just a museum, everything arranged for the visitors to walk through. Here you can see it's a house where every room is lived in, used by the family. It's full of books, so everything the family has collected over decades, a century or more, is on show. <laughs> Raleigh's occupation of Myrtle Grove is overlaid with the memories of later owners, the Blakes, who bought the house in the 19th century. Sir Henry Blake was a diplomat, later British governor in Hong Kong and Jamaica. His wife's paintings and drawings of Caribbean scenes, butterflies and rare plants fill the walls. And her portrait hangs in the drawing room. The Blakes found in Myrtle Grove the perfect home to retire to. Today, their great-granddaughter, Shirley Murray, cares for Myrtle Grove and its historic connection with Sir Walter Raleigh. Well, this house was the house he's lived in during his time as Mayor of Yule. He got his grant of Munster from Elizabeth I in 1585, but he had various other places that he lived in. Certainly, he stayed at Lismore Castle. But when he was mayor of Yall in 1588, he had to be here to keep an eye that the Spaniards didn't come into Yall Harbour. Edmund Spencer came here to stay with Raleigh. They had been friends since about 1580. And probably when Spencer was travelling back to England, he would have stayed here waiting for a suitable ship. He is supposed to have written a little bit of the Fairy Queen here, but it's so very long. I'm sure he wrote it in many places. He went from here 
with Raleigh to go to the court to try and persuade the Queen to actually assist in the publication of his great long epic all about her. <laughs> Are there any fascinating bits of Raleigh memorabilia left in the house still? Well, certainly we have what is supposed to have been Raleigh's pipe, or the bowl of it at any rate. It was sent as a present to my great-grandparents to be kept here in Raleigh's house in York. And this extraordinary sort of thing is meant to have been part of his pipe. He firmly believed that the pipe was a great accompaniment for his ale tankard. And he tried to grow Virginia tobacco here, but of course the climate wasn't very suitable and it didn't grow. Tell me what you're doing to keep this house going, because it must be a struggle against the elements. Yes, it is. I, ha I do now take guided tours around, but we're going to do things very slowly. There's no point in trying to rush it. And I think it's very important to keep the character of a home and not just a museum. It is quite small. We use all the rooms ourselves, and people are quite likely to meet a dog or a cat as they walk around and they can't expect it to be absolutely perfect. <laughs> and that, surely, is how it was when Sir Walt lived here. Myrtle Grove must have been the ideal place to get away from the strain of being the world's most famous explorer, not to mention the man who gave us tobacco. <coughs> this magnificent ancient volume is Raleigh's History of the World, and inside, in this spidery hand, we find the author's epitaph, it says here, writ by himself. Even such is time, which takes in trust our youth and joys and all we have and pays us but with age and dust, which in the dark and silent grave which we have wandered all our ways shuts up the story of our days, and from which earth and grave and dust the Lord shall raise me up, I trust. drawing room is very much as Sir Walter Raleigh would have known it. Well, we're surrounded by Elizabethan panelling, but often in these houses, this panelling was introduced and put together in the 19th century. But we know here from a description in Charles II's time that this ancient chimney piece was here. And you can see these figures of faith, hope and charity beautifully carved in wonderful condition. Well, at the end of the 16th century and early in the 17th century, England was constantly at war with the Catholic countries. So we bought a lot from Holland, fellow Protestant country. So you find in England and Ireland these Dutch tiles in fireplaces. There was a great fashion for it, for blue and white ware. And here's a wonderful collection. You can see one after another of windmills, little country scenes, figures playing games. You can see children with hoops. It's a wonderful set of these tiles, which have been there, we guess, for nearly 300 years. What's the story with this cabinet here? That's not from Holland, is it? Once again, the Blakes. When he was in Hong Kong as governor, he was invited to, J to Japan. And his hosts obviously guided him to the best places, because there you have an exceptionally elaborate cabinet. You can see, not only is it beautifully carved, but it has these panels which are inlaid with pictures which are done in ivory and other pictures done in mother of pearl. And if you open the doors, you can look inside and there is lacquer work on the backs of the doors. It's like those lacquer cabinets which were made often in Holland and Antwerp in the 17th century with a very architectural centerpiece. But instead of opening the doors and finding a ballroom with mirrors, as you often did with the Antwerp cabinets. Here you have a delightful Japanese shrine in the center, approached by these flights of steps. One of the surprises that lies ahead is the garden. And here, there was a Chinese garden. And you can see these twin elephants supporting this chest. Now, they were originally garden seats. And on the wall here is one of my favorite Victorian painters a man called Henry Woods, who painted these delightful 
outdoor scenes in Italy. In all these pictures, you're always guessing what they were talking about, that they've all suddenly turned to look at something. It might be a boy crying, or here is the traveling salesman has arrived, and they're all looking, the children have their eyes on him, other people are still half in conversation. And they were made as a kind of conversation piece that you could spend half an hour over dinner trying to guess what they're all saying. And this carpet? Which fills the room, was ordered from China, from Tianjin. The housekeeper sent out the dimensions. It came back in 1902, fitting the room exactly. And what's the story of these two rather saucy figures above the chimney piece here? <laughs> oh, they're Shilani gigs, fertility symbols, suitably naked. <laughs> seems to have sunk somewhat since it was built. Well, I wonder what a modern surveyor would make of this panelling. He'd probably condemn the house at once. But you can see, although clearly at some stage the floor or the ceiling has tilted, this panelling is still extremely handsome. It may have been cut about a bit, but this is the panelling as Raleigh would probably have known it. You can see these pilasters on the wall. These early examples of the Renaissance coming to Ireland with the scroll capitals, that's the Ionic order, and then the doors, I think, are Georgian additions. They've been put in, it's been altered, and there's a very handsome lock case you can see there, a nice Georgian brass lock case, and as well as having a, a key to turn uh, on one side, there's a bolt on the inside which can't be operated from outside, so you can lock yourself in and be completely private. And there's another nice story attaches to this room, that beside one of the windows, they removed a panel and found a hole, a little hidden chamber, which had the remains of the old monkish library. And in there, they found some perfectly preserved manuscripts and some very early printed volumes. And an intriguing story follows on that Disraeli, apparently, once disputed whether Sir Walter Raleigh, imprisoned in the tower, could have written his great history because he didn't have enough books to hand. But when these manuscripts were found here, it was discovered that one of the books, one of the sources Raleigh might have used was the very volume sitting here in the house. Now, one of the discoveries to be made here is the garden. These early houses had wall gardens. The gardens was like a series of rooms, one after the other, completely enclosed. And I think there are six here. Now, the first of these gardens is, intriguingly, a Chinese garden. And the reason is that the Blakes brought with them a splendid pair of metal gates which were in the wall. Now, these were taken from a rather rebellious village in the New Territories, which didn't take kindly to the British takeover. But 24 years later, the villagers said, please give us back our gates. You know, we're going to behave well from now on. And the gates went back. What you see now are the handsome replacements which they sent. Now, if we go through this arc, we're in a different world altogether. You remember the Blakes were in Jamaica? Well, here we are in Jamaica with these rows of cabbage palms. Of course, one of the great sights of Jamaica are these sugar plantations with these great abandoned sugar factories, wonderful buildings. And here, suddenly, is one, this great ruin. And what it is, is an abandoned brewery closed down in the 1830s these huge walls, these great arches are here. It's just like a Jamaican plantation. What would Sir Walter Raleigh have made of it? I think he would have been delighted to think that other travelers and explorers had taken it on.
Two hours' drive north of Myrtle Grove, we meet the Honourable Desmond Guinness, the Diane of country house experts in Ireland and founder of the Irish Georgian Society. This is the man who's devoted his life to studying and writing about Ireland's grandest homes. He's even lived in several of them, and he still does. Home is Leeslip Castle, a Norman stronghold turned house complete with Gothic windows. But when he and his wife went house hunting in the late 1950s, was this what they had been looking for? No, absolutely not. We wanted a Palladian house, a classical house, but we did love this part of Ireland, which was very countrified then. Leaslip had a population of 600 people, and no bank, you couldn't get your clothes cleaned, there was no cobbler. We now have 16,000 people and two banks since the time that I've come to live here. And a dry cleaners, I hope. And several dry cleaners, yes. What to you is the special appeal of Ireland's great houses? I think it's the fact that we were so poor in the 19th century that um, a great many of them are untouched. Whereas in England was so rich, what with India and coal under the land there, um, whereas Ireland was in the aftermath of the terrible famine of 1845. And um, so we left our houses alone. We couldn't do anything else about them. And so we didn't um, alter them or bring them up to date in the Victorian period because we were in a terrible slough of despond at that time. Over the years, you've visited a great many houses in Ireland, haven't you? Yes, yes, I really have. I made a sort of speciality of the country houses um, of this country and wrote really the first book. It was called Irish Houses and Castles, Thames and Hudson, some 25 years ago. My latest book is called Great Irish Houses and Castles, and on it you'll see, on the cover, you'll see a picture of Castletown, which was saved by the Irish Georgian Society, and was the most important thing, I suppose, that we accomplished. What about the history of this house? It goes back many, many centuries. This is a real uh, Norman castle. It's a stronghold, or was. It probably was just a square keep at one time. And then it was turned into a house in the 17th century and made habitable. And big windows were pushed through the thick walls. You see how thick the walls in the dining room are. And then it was turned back into a castle. So in this one building, you can really see the changing tastes making a full circle. It starts off as a castle, turned into a house with square windows, and then the Gothic windows that you saw um, came to replace the square windows, and the battlements were put on probably in the early 19th century. We really don't know. It's nice to think that just below us, just across the river from here, in the Protestant church, lies buried a man called Archbishop Price, who in his will left a hundred pounds to my servant Richard Guinness and another hundred pounds to his son Arthur Guinness and uh, this was the foundation of the Guinness brewery and the Guinness family fortune so we have a lot to thank Archbishop Price for and funnily enough although he didn't live in Leeslip he's buried under the aisle of our church Here is a medieval castle, which is also a delight to live in. And the reason is, the windows aren't narrow slits for bowmen. They're big windows with this wonderful Strawberry Hill Gothic glazing. These are almost the most enchanted castles you will ever find, done up really in an amusing and attractive way by their Georgian owners. The most attractive houses in many ways, and for certainly for most people, are those which are still lived in. They're furnished. They have the sense of the family there. 
And there are so many of these houses, it's quite impossible to think that they could all be open to the public, whether they were looked after by government or national trusts or other institutions. It's vital that families still want to live in them. And here, you can sense very strongly the romance of the country house, which lives on in the 20th century. We saw it at Myrtle Grove, Sir Walter Raleigh's house, and we see it here. These houses are full of furniture, there are books, magazines, the evidence of family life all around us. And here in Ireland, there are 2,000 of these houses. It is one of the richest concentrations you'll find in the whole of Europe. But it's been a battleground to save these houses ever since their lands were taken away early in the 20th century. But it's a battle with many heroes that people have come forward again and again when the ancient owners have died or gone away. There have been new people willing to come on and take up these houses. It's one of the great romantic stories of the 20th century. And the delight is that there are still people who are in love with these houses and who will take them on. And long may it continue to be so. So at Myrtle Grove and here at Leaslip, the evidence that Ireland does indeed contain some of the great houses of Europe. Sir Walter Raleigh's house, Myrtle Grove, is at Yule, an hour's drive from Cork. The town's easy to find, but you'll need local advice to help you round the one-way system. <laughs> 